Shalom Chavrim. It's good to get a chance to speak with you guys again. Uh, we are safely back here in the United States here. We'll be here probably for the next uh, 60 days, something like that, before we head back home to Israel. Uh, we just had some things we need to take care of here in the process as we uh, work on the ministry over there in Israel. Uh, so anyway, uh, I wanted to talk to you guys because on Sunday we were at the Temple Institute. We went on a guided tour. Uh, it's not a big place there. In fact, if you are going to be in Israel in the next couple of months, I know a, a friend of mine, John Kostik, will be there in October, uh, which will be back in Israel by the end as any, at this point anyway. But uh, in the old city, in the Jewish quarter, as you're headed down to the Kotel, you'll come across, right when you get ready to go down the steps, you come to the back end of the Jewish quarter, you'll see two big old uh, concrete lions there, and just to the right is the Temple Institute. Um, when you go up the steps there, that used to actually be a, uh, um, years ago, that was a little gift shop store there, actually a, a big gift shop store, but that gift shop ended up moving uh, across the walkway there, and of course, they have their own gift shop as well. has a lot of nice things in there if you'd like to pick up anything. But, uh, but, but at any rate, we the tour there, it's in three different rooms. And uh, it's probably about an hour and a half long. Maybe an hour. Maybe not fully an hour and a half. Maybe more like about an hour. But there were some things said there that really concerned me. Now... There's without a question, I believe, without any question whatsoever, there's definitely going to be a third temple. We have scriptural evidence that supports it. We know that. Uh, we know that we are the temple of God as well. The temple itself only reflects who we are. In fact, when we look at the prophecy, uh, the most high dwelleth not in temples made by hand, but a body has thou prepared me. Now, this is actually the prophecy of Yahshua, this is Christ coming. This is Mashiach, is that temple. That's the body that thou hast prepared me. But we also know that he comes and dwells in our heart. He re basically, when Christ came and gave his life as a sacrifice, that was to, to put his own life back in us, what was forfeited in the Garden of Eden. But as we did the video the other day with uh, Brother Rob uh, Conrad there, one of the things that we talked about was the fact that during the millennium, or not just the millennium, but even during the seven years of uh, the last seven years, God is going to once again reinstitute the temple. The temple will be built, and there will be sacrifices offered. We know that the Antichrist is going to put a stop to, to, to the sacrifices. Which, Speaking of that, let me just mention something. I got a lot of comments from couple of individuals there, or maybe just one, saying that it was not in the, the Tanakh, it's not in the teachings that if any, you ask any rabbi, they would tell you there is no such teaching as an Antichrist in the, as they put it, the Old Testament, the Tanakh. But that's actually not true. The word Antichristo, which means a substitute or replacement uh, for Mashiach, it is written. It's written in the book of Daniel. Because if you ever notice in the book of Daniel, in Daniel 70 of, 70 of weeks, when he's speaking about that, he talks about an anointed prince. Now that word in Hebrew is Mashiach, the anointed prince. But then he also speaks about the prince that is to come. Now, it's still a prince in both cases, but one is anointed, the other is not anointed. So that is the actual scripture that proves that there is an antichrist. In other words, there is a prince that does come. There is the anointed prince, and the anointed prince is to be cut off. And in both cases, it speaks about that prince, which was Yeshua, that he would be cut off. But the prince that shall come will be of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, a Roman. But it doesn't speak anything about him being Mashiach, but just a prince. So there's your, just for the sake of argument, so you can kind of see how that that's written in there. Now, anyway, as we did the tour, there was one thing that really caught my attention. When you go into the second room of the tour, this is where you're going to find um, two, um, I guess, you'd, statues of people. It's, one represents the, 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 the man that's working in... Uh, uh, that's working in the temple, a Kohanim, uh, which is uh, one of the priests there. 
and they have him dressed in white and he's got a, like a sash around his waist, but the sash is a little bit of a different color. And then they show the high priest and the high priest is dressed there and I can show you some images of this, uh, but he's dressed there and he's got like a vesture, a vest on him. And this is where you have the little bells around his waist there. Uh, and the breastplate of Aaron is, is around his neck. Uh, he's dressed very much showing that he is the high priest. And, but it was when we went from there to where you go into the room, this just before the Holy of Holies, just before the Ark of the Covenant. And now the same high priest is standing there, but this time he's dressed only in white. And as a, as a tour guide, He's a, he's a Jewish gentleman that's very well trained for this purpose here. He explains to us about the fact that in this case here, the high priest is in nothing but white. Of course, this is only on Yom Kippur, the one day of the year where the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies to offer the sacrifice for the sins of Israel. And he said the reason why he dresses in all white is to show the humbleness and the humility of his service. He's no longer dressed in the fancy pomp of the high priest where he wears the breastplate and the, and the different colored thing that's over his white uh, clothes, etc. But this place, he humbles himself. In fact, the guided tour made the mention as well, he never lifts his hands above his head, or maybe it was his shoulders. He said, showing that he's subject to God. And it was very interesting uh, especially when he gets to the part about um, that in the, in the service that they do here, the high priest, it was always to show humility. And it was, everything was done specifically to show that the man was not to be worshipped, but God was to be worshipped. Now what caught my attention about all this is the fact that he was an only white when he goes into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. And I could not help but think, the one time in all the history of the Vatican, it was Pope Francis that actually began to change the whole service of what's going on at the Vatican. When he came out, when he was elected as the Pope or the Pontiff for the Roman Catholic Church, he broke all of history when he came out and he only wore solid white. He was not wearing the red shoes, nor the, I don't know what they call this thing here, but it's like a cape or something that, the, that, the, that the, pre, the, the new pope will wear. It's a red one. And, and of course, this shows his elevated status. And when I'm watching in this, uh, this, this uh, guided tour that we're on, immediately I was thinking to myself, he is, Pope Francis is telling the world by his own actions, that he is the high priest. And it didn't end there, though. During the time that we were, that we were doing this tour here, uh, in fact, right after the tour, my wife actually uh, goes up to the, to, the, to the guide there and began to ask him some very pointed questions. One of those questions was, the temple you guys are building, is this Ezekiel's temple? And he said to her, according to Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 40 and 41 and so on, and he says, no, this is not the temple that Ezekiel built. And she said, well, then what will happen to this temple here? This is, she said, this is the third temple, correct? And he said, yes. And by the way, they are looking to build, if they've not already done it, they're building a, a temporary temple about 30 miles outside of Jerusalem. I thought that was interesting. It will have stone walls and everything, but they're putting a tent over the top to make it a what would be considered like a sukkah or a sukkot, uh, a temporary dwelling. And then from there, they're talking about moving into the temple later when that is ready to be built. Uh, but it was interesting, though, that he, he was kind of lost for a moment. And he says, because uh, my wife said, well, in that case, then will, when will this one be destroyed? He said, we're, we're not going to destroy it. She said, well, then when is Ezekiel's temple going to be built? And he didn't know how to answer the question. And there were so many things that were happening that were really beginning to bring a, a concern to me. Another thing that was said during the actual, um, now this was during the, the tour, and as he spoke on things, he began to mention about David 
and how David had a desire to want to build the temple. They show the pictures on the wall. They had different pictures. And in one picture here, they depict David's big royal home that he had built. He says, this is what kings do. And that's true. And they showed in the picture there, in the painting there, in the background, you could see the temple, and it was under, a, or not a temple, but you could see the, um, the Ark of the Covenant was in a tent. And David was troubled by this. And he says, Lord, he says, you know, and he goes to the prophet Nathan, and he says, you know, how be it that I live in a house of cedar, and my Lord is dwelling here in a tent? And of course, it seemed like a good thing. Then Nathan thought it was a nice thing too. And of course, God, he consults God. God tells him, he says, no. He says, go back and tell my servant David that his son will build my temple because his hands are, are filled with blood. Now, the tour guide made an interesting comment about that. He says, now, it's not that David, what he was doing as far as, you know, having to kill the people in the land was not a righteous thing. He said he was doing it for the sake of life, you know. True, and I agree with that. He said, but there was no way that David could build the temple. He said, because he was a man of war. And he said, but Solomon, who was a man of peace, he made this comment, he was a man of peace. He would be the one that would build the temple. As I'm listening to this, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, where is this going? What are... Uh, and maybe not. Maybe it was just me thinking this. But I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you guys are doing these tour guides and you're telling about the building of the third temple and you're setting the people up for the Pope to build the temple. <sighs> or, or at least maybe the financing of it or whatever. Now, now I'm not saying that's going to happen that way, but I mean, this is just really strange. But then he makes another comment. And that is... He says that Israel, that Jerusalem is not even in the hands of Israel. And I asked my wife after after we could come out there, I said, did you hear what he said? That Jerusalem is not in the hands of Israel, that they can't do anything about the things in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is not in Israel's hands? She said, I heard that. And I said, well, it's not in the Palestinians' hands either. And he's, but he made the comment, all Jerusalem is not under Israeli control. He says, the Jerusalem is not all, he said, all, of, all of Jerusalem, Israel has no control over Jerusalem. Now, you don't think that Israel, did, that, that Shimon Perez didn't sell out the Jerusalem to the Vatican back in 1993. We got something else coming. They're just trying to get the Jews to go along with what's going on in the background right now. Well, it didn't end with that. <laughs> it just, it did not end there. So we have that. We have uh, that Israel doesn't belong there. But then he makes one other astonishing remark. And this was when my wife was asking him about the building of the third temple. She said, well, when are you guys going to build it? And he says, well, we can't build it until all the nations are ready for it. And I said to him, I said, well, we need to destroy the Dome of the Rock. He said, no. He said, it can't happen like that. So I just, I got quiet for a moment. I wanted to hear what he had to say. And so my wife was talking to him about it. So I began to listen after I made the comment about destroying the Dome of the Rock. And he said, it wouldn't happen that way. He says, no. He says, the scripture clearly says that, that it will be a house of prayer for all nations. He said, the Palestinians have got to be willing and want the third temple as well. He said, then the temple will come. And when I heard that, I, I, I was dumbfounded. I'm like, okay, let's look at the scenario here. One, it'll have to be built by a man of peace, not a man with blood on his hands. That's pretty interesting. They're going to say that the Pope is that man of peace. In fact, the Pope is the only one that can buy off the Palestinians to get the temple built in the first place. Which in that case, seems they're willing to build a, a temporary temple 30 miles, 30 miles outside of the city, it's a good possibility that the third temple is not going to be built where the Dome of the Rock is. When they do build it, it's a good possibility it's going to be built right alongside of it. Now, 
I know Brother Rob is believing that they're going that something's going to happen to the Dome of the Rock and they're going to build it there. And that still is a good possibility as well. So keep that in mind. If there is an earthquake and the Dome of the Rock were to fall and collapse, that may be the very time where the Vatican can get the Palestinians agreeable to do a third temple as well because they might justify the fact that God has destroyed it and doesn't want it there anymore. But this part about blood being on David's hands, they're going to say that Israel's hands are full of blood from all the wars. It takes a man of peace. Not like the Roman Catholic Church hasn't put to death 66 million Christians down through the ages as well as Jews and is still on a rampage. In fact, it's something that my friend Gershon Solomon had pointed out to me in a conversation we had the other day. But this is absolutely amazing to me. And I think they're setting the stage for the Pope to be the man that will help bring about the building of the Third Temple. It's troubling as well. And if all this takes place, if the Third Temple is built and it is not built where the Dome of the Rock is sitting, but built to the side, then I can't say that that's Ezekiel's temple. It would almost seem that it have to be destroyed again. But I, I, I'm really lost for words. You know, when you think that you really understand where something's, <coughs> what's going on, then there's always a curveball to go in there with it as well. <coughs> anyway, one other thing I want to share with you that, that happened here just the other night. Um, we went for a walk. It's probably about 1230 at night. And a um, little playground not far from where our house is. And our little daughter was with us. And I, I thought, you know, she hadn't seen this little playground. It's kind of a little uh, awkward place to get to. So I thought, you know, told my wife, let's go for a walk. We went for a walk. And... Uh, while we were walking with her, I just kind of had it on my heart. I'm going to go show her where this little playground's at. So I just kind of direct my wife as we're walking, not telling her where we're going. Next thing you know, we end up going up to the, where the playground's at. And while we're there, our little daughter decides, oh, wow, here's a slide. She's got to slide down this slide at 1230 at night. So she does. And uh, as she's sliding down the slide and stuff, these two uh, Haredi Jews come out, or Hasidic Jews as we call it. And that's the Jews that have the little locks on their sides there. And they, and they, and they come out. And my wife at first were, was thinking, because they come, they, one of them was saying something to her. And she thought, you know, because a lot of times when you're in the old city, they will ask if you, if you can help give to feed a family or something. Mitzvot is what it would be considered to being, is when you're giving, you're, you're, you're doing good. Um, and so my wife said, no, I, I don't. I don't, I don't have any, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't think to bring anything. And the guy says, no, 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 I'm not asking for money. Well, one of the, one of the uh, Jewish brothers there, you could tell something was wrong, seriously wrong. And he was holding his head and he was groaning. And, uh, and then he went over there on the ground and he just laid down. And so I began to talk to him in Hebrew and I asked him what was wrong with him. And, um, and he was saying that he was sick. Something had happened to him. I, I couldn't understand what he was trying to describe had happened to him, but he had had, it seemed to me from what he was explaining to me is that he had had like a head injury or something, but he was really bad off. And he didn't know what to do about it. And so I finally, I asked him, do you mind if we pray for him? And he says, no, that, yeah, that would be fine. And so we go over there to him and, and I ask him as well, and uh, he was okay with that. And we knelt down together, me and my wife, and we prayed for this, uh, this young man, probably early 20s. And my wife as well laid hands on him and prayed for him in the name of Yeshua. And when we were done praying for this young man, we got up and we walked away. And I felt the presence of God come down. And when I did, I, felt, I told my wife, I said, he's healed. I said, I know God has healed this man. And as we walked away, they were thankful that we, that we had prayed for him. I told my wife, I said, do you realize the miracle that you have just witnessed? 
And she says, this was wonderful. And uh, I said, but do you realize what the miracle was? She said, what do you mean? I said, the miracle was that a Haredi Jew allowed you as a woman to lay hands on him and pray for him. I said, he would have never, ever let a woman touch him. I said, that was God that have made this possible. I said, God directed our footsteps to go to this park at 1230 at night, a place we would have never thought to have gone to it. Well, you know, not to say we wouldn't have walked there, but it's not something that was convenient for us to go to. It was kind of out of the way. I said, but that was a, the mere fact that he allowed not only for us to pray for him, and when as we were praying, it was my wife that prayed for him and, and used the name of Yeshua. I was praying for him as a, as a Jewish brother, praying for him. You know, I'd not mentioned the name of Yeshua audibly, but she mentions it audibly. I said, but the fact that he let a woman touch him, because see, a woman is not to touch a man in the Haredi belief. You know, unless it's your wife, they feel like that that's not right. I said, that was the miracle. Anyway, lovely time. Uh, we can't wait to get back home. I know Israel is a place that you, it has to be in your heart. It has to be in your heart. But uh, we've had a wonderful time since we've been there. A lot of work to do. A lot of work still yet to do. So we ask, we ask you to be praying, praying for us as well if you want to be a part of this. And by the way, I know there's some people that sent us emails they were having a little trouble getting onto our website because uh, they wanted to be able to give towards the ministry. And we haven't figured out what the era is as, as of yet, but we've got some people working in the background on it. Uh, if you do www.israelreturns.com, that's where we get an era code. But if you do the HTTP colon forward slash forward slash then israelreturns.com, you don't have any problem at all getting onto the website. So if you're having a problem, because you are trying to do that, I just thought I'd share that with you. Anyway, we love you, and God bless you, and we'll be talking to you again real soon. Good night.